With all of the intrigue surrounding the mysterious mass murder of four University of Idaho students on Sunday, November 13th, at the off-campus house they shared in Moscow, Idaho, it's hard not to draw comparisons to notorious crimes from the past that, in a similar way, kept the public guessing for months on end until they were finally solved. While there are likely hundreds, if not thousands, such cases, one in particular seems to mirror the Idaho student murders in hauntingly similar ways. It's the early morning hours of August 9th, 1969 in Los Angeles at the Benedict Canyon home of actress Sharon Tate and her husband, filmmaker Roman Polanski. There, Tate, along with four others, including her hairdresser friend Jay Sebring, Polish artist Wojtek Frykowski and his girlfriend, coffee heiress Abigail Folger, and a young teenager Stephen Parent are found by a housekeeper, brutally stabbed, in what investigators at the time describe as one of the most horrific crime scenes they've ever seen. The crime shocked the world for its brutality and sheer randomness. Now let's break down the Idaho College murders and the Tate LaBianca murders to see how they are similar. In both cases, the murders were committed in single-family homes on the edge of town, known as party houses, with all manner of people coming and going at all hours of the day. The mansion that Sharon Tate and Roman Polanski rented in the hills above Los Angeles was the site of parties frequented by the Hollywood elite and likely more than a few hangar honors. In Moscow, the house on King Street has been widely reported as a party house, close to the fraternities and sororities that line the south edge of campus and a popular drop-in spot for students at the college. Like the Tate LaBianca murders, where drugs and drug paraphernalia were found, containers of alcohol and beer cans were found scattered around the property, causing many to speculate that alcohol and or drugs might have had something to do with the crime. There are multiple similarities between the five victims in Bel Air and the four college students in Moscow. In both cases, the victims were young, attractive, and for the most part, upstanding members of their respective communities. The victims in both cases were privileged, good-looking, and were part of an inner circle, one that it wouldn't be hard to imagine a frustrated assailant might wish he or she was a part of and would exact revenge for their inability to penetrate. In both the Tate LaBianca and King Street murders, a knife was the primary murder weapon, indicating a crime of passion, and both crime scenes were reported to be remarkably violent. But unlike the Moscow killings, in the case of Sharon Tate, a knife wasn't the only weapon used to take the lives of the victims. Tate had been stabbed 16 times, five of which the coroner said would have been fatal. She also appeared to have been hung from a rafter in the ceiling by a rope that was tied around the neck of her and Jay Sebring, who had himself been shot at close range, stabbed seven times, and died from blood loss caused by the stab wounds. Abigail Folger had been stabbed 28 times, Frykowski 51 times, and shot twice. Stephen Parent, the youngest of the victims, had been shot four times at close range. The most notable evidence turned up at the Tate LaBianca crime scene included pools of blood from which samples were extracted, pieces of a gun butt from a 22 caliber buntline revolver, several small knives, the rope, and a pair of reading glasses that didn't belong to anyone living in the home. Additionally, investigators found fingerprints, three ounces of marijuana, 30 grams of hashish, a gram of cocaine, and 10 capsules of MDA, creating widespread speculation that the crimes were drug-related. At the time of this video, not much has been reported regarding the specific evidence found at the King Street home, other than investigators mentioning 103 pieces of evidence collected over the course of 10 days. Like the Tate LaBianca murders, investigators have referred to that crime scene as blood-soaked. An image of what appeared to be blood dripping from the house's foundation has been widely circulated on the internet. William Gerritsen, a caretaker who lived on the property and survived the murders while being holed up in the guest house, was arrested, but later released after passing a polygraph test. This led to rampant speculation among the media and the general public on who committed the murders and why. The most popular theories included that the murders had been the result of a drug deal gone bad, a satanic ritual of some kind, or the work of a deranged fan who'd been obsessed with Sharon Tate. At one point, Mama Cass Elliot of the Mamas and the Papas was deemed a suspect because of her connection to a group of Canadian men who'd fled the country after a drug charge was brought against them. Psychics and mediums were called on for their expertise and provided some intrigue but not much hard evidence to go on. In the case of the Idaho student murders, a number of theories have been floated about who committed the crimes and why. It took investigators three months to solve the Tate LaBianca murders after an inmate at a women's prison in jail for unrelated charges confessed to a cellmate that her and her friends were the ones who 
killed those pigs up in Beverly Hills. The public was shocked to learn the woman, Susan Denise Atkins, AKA Sadie, was a member of a roving band of hippies known as the Manson family. And it was she, along with three other members who, at the behest of their diabolical leader, a diminutive ex-con named Charlie, not only killed Sharon Tate and the others at the Cielo Drive House, but also a grocery store owner, Leo LaBianca, and his wife the very next night, and were connected to a string of crimes around Southern California, including grand theft auto, burglary, forgery, and drug dealing. Even more astounding was the motivation for the murders, which would come to light during the trial in 1970 that the murders were an attempt to, in part, initiate a race war between blacks and whites called Helter Skelter after the Beatles song of the same name, and also redirect attention away from a suspect in another murder, sometime family member Bobby Beausoleil. As for the King Street murders, was the killer someone who had stalked the roommates, waiting for the perfect opportunity to commit such a heinous crime? Was it a scorned lover or would-be lover, enacting revenge for his or her perceived slight? Or worse, an anonymous serial killer who, as we speak, is busy planning his or her next attack. Only time will tell. But until then, as they did in the Tate LaBianca case, the public will continue to speculate, undoubtedly weaving unimaginable yarns about what actually took place that night in Moscow, Idaho, that robbed four young, innocent victims of the rest of their lives. Thank you for watching.